Okay, so we had covered eight verses. Today we will start the ninth verse. So please unmute yourself and you can chant with me. Tat Sangat Venis Sangat Vam. Nisangatvam <laughs> Vejivan Mukti So Satsangatve Nisangatvam. So Satsang is, of course, you know, all of you know, is a company of good people, noble people. And it is very important. Why? Because our mind is continuously influenced by the environment. We may all think that we have very strong minds and all, but ultimately the mind is very easily influenced by the environment, which is why different people have different states of mind according to the inputs that have been given to the mind by the environment in which it grew up. So if the mind is in the company of noble people, of Satpurushas, then the mind gets trained to follow certain important values, certain spiritual values, it gets an appropriate perspective of life. Spiritual priorities are there. So, satsangatve. Because of that, the influence of satsang, satsanga can completely change a person's life. And many of you who have been to the ashram know that the satsangs are very powerful. Are a very powerful tool because they produce, they provide a very conducive environment for our spiritual growth. So, ashramas, gurukulas, temples, all these are very places which we should be seeking out as, as the sadhakas. And when you are in satsang, basically these noble people, what do they do? They talk about the teaching of the shastra. So here satsangam, satsangam means shastric teaching, exposure to shastric teaching. And if it is not possible every day, it's okay, but at least regularly, once, twice a week, our Vedantic study should be supplemented by discussion with like-minded people. So if you are talking to the people in your Prakarana group, that is also satsang because everybody has a like-mindedness like, like is, is present in everybody. They all want spiritual growth. And what is the advantage of having been exposed to satsang? Nisangatvam, satsangatve, through the exposure to satsang, what comes? Nisangatvam. So, Sangam is attachment. Nisangatvam is detachment. So, one can begin to get detached. And once detachment is there, you are free from dependence either on your likes or on your dislikes. So, Raga Dvesha Rahita relationship. A relationship which is free of raga and dvesha, that is a relationship in which there is true freedom. And then one can enjoy all our relationships. Raga is definitely attachment. It is dependence. Why? Because when I have raga, when I have attachment towards a person, I very often mistake it as love. But essentially, it is a dependence. Because I love that person or I am attached to that person only because of the fact that the person satisfies certain emotional needs of mine. So it's a dependence. And Raga and Dvesha are both two sides of the same coin. Therefore, both are dependence. 
And we have seen in Bhagavad Gita that dependence gives rise to uh, weak and unhealthy relationships because, because of that dependence, there is certain value attached to the partner which is not really objective. And therefore, any dependence gives rise to a loss of objectivity. And therefore, I tend to think <clears throat> that my happiness is dependent upon situations around me, upon people around me, about objects around me. Those situations, those people and those objects, for me, they acquire a value far beyond their real value. That is what is meant by dispassion. Dispassion basically, nisangatvam, is the ability to see something without any superimposed values. Right? How do you say, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> Supposing you go to the one of the guys, okay? Supposing one of the guys goes to the market to buy tomatoes, let us say. And he comes back with not so great tomatoes. Okay? Slightly, maybe, you know, bad tomatoes. And the wife tells him, you know, you can't buy tomatoes, you're so useless. Do you see where is, in that statement, do you see where is the superimposed value? In the statement where the spouse makes, saying you're useless, what is the superimposed value? She's transferring the... Yes. The, the usefulness of the the the, <clears throat> the the rottenness of the tomatoes onto the partner. Um, no, <clears throat> that may not be really true. But the correct statement should be what? The tomatoes are useless. No, no, you're talking about the person, right? Tomatoes are useless, that's a fact. But undervaluing the spouse. What, what you are telling the, the person, what you can tell objectively to the person is say that you don't know how to buy tomatoes. Yes, hmm. without Correct. using the yeah. <clears throat> And that you don't know how to buy tomatoes, when you make it, you are useless. You have superimposed that uselessness in buying the tomato into all these transactions, which is loss of objectivity. Right? Objective person would say that, no, you don't know how to buy tomatoes. And if you want to be you know, more supportive, you'll say, come with me next time. I'll show you how to buy tomatoes. You touch the tomato, you see how it is firm, all those you see. So that is what is meant here. This passion means being able to see a situation as it is, which means seeing it without the, without the you know, curtain of your likes and dislikes. Whenever you look at something through your likes and dislikes, the, there's a 95% chance, 99% chance that the objectivity has been lost because raga and vesha are there. And therefore, if you really want to look at any state, any person or event or object for its true value, you have to look at it very, very dispassionately without letting your emotions get in the way. I'm not saying emotions should not be there. I'm saying you should realize that emotions are there. And you should realize that in these sort of transactions, emotions have no value, have no place. And therefore, this passion, I said, leads to freedom. Okay. Now, this, this passion. So, the next one is Nisangatve Nirmohatvam. So, Moha also we saw in Bhagavad Gita. What is Moha? Delusion. Delusion. So, a deluded mind what does it do? It superimposes an unjustified value, an unrealistic value upon some object. That is what is called moha. So we saw in Bhagavad Gita, we had a very detailed discussion on moha. We said that if you think, <clears throat> you know, for example, let me take, you know, another, another example. You are very tired, you know, and you ask for a coffee. And somebody gives you a coffee. And you say that coffee saved my life. Now what has happened? That coffee has basically done what? It has satisfied your need for a warm drink. To get over your tiredness. You needed the caffeine. 
to get give you a quick pick up and get over your tiredness. But that real value was what? Real value was that I need something and in the warm drink to get my tiredness over, over with. But you are superimposing, you saved my life. Now, that saved my life maybe just a, you know, a, a phrase of speech, a turn of speech. But sometimes you sometimes, not sometimes, most of the times what we do is we give a greater value which is, which, is what I, which is what I call a superimposed value. Unrealistic superimposed value. A greater value than it really deserves to any object of the world. And that is moha. The, the inability to see the correct value of an object, that is moha. So, nisangatve nirmohatva. Because dispassion is what? Freedom from raga and dvesha. Freedom from violent emotions. And freedom from violent emotions means that you are no longer subject. Your mind is clear. The intellect thinks. Out of the antakarna, the intellect is the, the buddhi is the thinking portion. And that buddhi is in charge instead of manas. Manas is the place where there are emotions. And when the mind takes decisions, it's usually without reference to the buddhi. So it's so very likely to be wrong. And when buddhi takes over, it is analytical in nature. And therefore, when the mind has no violent emotions, the buddhi can function freely. When the mind is violently disturbed, the buddhi rarely ever functions effectively. That we all know. So this deluded mind, it superimposes an unjustified value upon a person or an object or an, or an event. And as your mind becomes more and more dispassionate, Nisangatvam. It becomes more and more free from moha, free from delusion. Nirmohatvam. Which means this nirmohatvam is what? It's free from raga and dvesha. This freedom from raga dvesha, which is freedom from all negative emotions and the freedom from a very violently wavering mind, we gave it another name in the Bhagavad Gita. Do you remember what it was? The Chitta Shuddhi, otherwise called Jnana Yogyata, a mind which is free of any emotion. It's not that emotions are not there in the mind, but those emotions are not allowed to interfere with the function of the Buddhi. Such a mind enjoys peace and balance. So this is the definition of a mind which is not in the, under the influence of Ragadvesha. If you are under the influence of Ragadvesha, you are prone to violent reactions. You know, when the smallest thing going good for you, you are on top of the world. The smallest thing going bad for you, you are completely depressed. That is, a, that is the usual state of a mind which is influenced by Ragadvesha. Now the question is, how do I know that my mind is getting purified? So Again, we saw in the Bhagavad Gita, there is something we call FIR, the frequency of mental disturbances, the intensity of mental disturbances, and the recovery time, the recovery back to normal from mental disturbance. So frequency, intensity, recovery time. If the frequent, the lower the frequency is, the more your mind is getting purified. The lower the intensity of the disturbance, it's only a mild irritation and not a raging anger, then the mind is getting purified. And the shorter the recovery time, you don't stay angry for or upset for hours together. The mind gets upset. It is the nature of the mind. But quickly, you recover. So they say in Sanskrit, Uttama Shanakopasya, the Uttama mind, you know, the mind which is the best mind, Shanakopasya, it's angry for Maybe an instant. Madhyame ghatakadvayam. The mind which is one step below that is offered, is, is there for, is, is angry for two hours, is upset for two hours. Then there is one mind, adhama mind, the lower mind, the mind which is not following in the best category or in the medium category, adhama mind. That mind, ahoratram, 
it is angry for the whole night and then there is a sinful mind he angry the whole of his life so that a small little couplet in sanskrit which shows how the mind is to be judged and the best mind which we should always be you know aiming at is a mind which is which gets disturbed we are admitting that after all mind is maya right mind is matter matter will get disturbed it is the nature of matter to be disturbed and the matter will get disturbed but our effort to be, should be to see that the moment it gets disturbed my intellect comes into play and says wow we are angry what examine the reason for the anger discard it and come back to normal when i stop looking at everything as aimed at myself you know when my ego is no longer in the picture when my ahankara is not no longer in the picture then it is possible to recover immediately otherwise you think things like how can he say this to me you know i am his father i am his brother i am his sister i am his uh, you know student i am his guru how can he talk to me like this when all that comes that is ego in the in the play ahankara in the play it is impossible for the mind to be completely free therefore this fir is a very important criteria which we use how frequently do i get disturbed what is the intensity of the disturbance and how quickly do i gain gain my normal peace of mind and if you do this regularly once a week once a month and keep a record you will see as your spiritual progress deepens you will see that the fir keeps dropping then nirmohatve nischala tatva so nirmohatve when the moha or delusion is gone when the mind has been calmed down nischala tatva tatva means the scriptural teaching nischalam it remains established the mind is able to understand the scriptures to remember the remember the teaching and to remain established in the teaching so where you know where the mind is not disturbed we compare it to the lake where there are no waves when a lake has absolutely no waves you can see to the bottom of the lake it's clear water not muddy water no disturbances are there therefore you can see even a coin at the bottom that is the comparison to a mind which is free of disturbance then what is it next nischala tatve jeevan mukti now this is basically a tautology when you are saying that i am i remember the teaching and i'm established them in all the time <clears throat> what is that which is there in your mind the teaching basically the teaching of the scripture is very simple what is that aham what is brahma aham brahma asmi you are brahman right tatvam asi you are brahman is the teaching and so when you say nischala tatvam that teaching you remember all the time remembering the teaching all the time is what is called jnana nishtha remaining established in that teaching and this is what he means by nischala tatvam that tatvam that scriptural truth it remains in your mind all the time nischalam and what is the truth i am brahma aham brahma asmi and when the truth is there all the time when you constantly remember that you are brahman that is what that state is called jivan mukti and therefore it says nischala tatve jivan mukti when that knowledge is established very firmly in your mind when it remains in your mind all the time jivan mukti it means that i know that i am brahman i know that i am immortal i know that i am all pervading i know that i am the only one who exists so even when the body exists when the rc is there i am aware that i am the oc so becoming free while having this body having this this conviction that i am brahman while having the body this is what is called jivan mukti so moksha has to be arrived at when the body is alive it's only when you are a jivan mukta then only is videha mukti possible only if you are free when you are alive 
then only will there be freedom when the body falls. Obviously, right? Because once you are a Jivan Muktaha, there is nothing more to be done. So, Prarabdha will take care that you will live the rest of the life allocated to you. When the body falls, you are Brahman alone. Right? And therefore, in this verse, it is very pertinent to recall what we call the ladder of fall in Bhagavad Gita. Does anybody remember what is the ladder of fall? Which chapter? Chapter 2. Chapter 2. Chapter 2. So, Dhyato Vishyam Pumsaha Sangaste Shupajayate Sangatamjayate Kamaha That two verses. Okay, 62 and 63. Yes. That you must remember. That is the ladder of fall. And that is exactly what is being said here. When the mind is free from all these things, then you are free. You, are, you have understood the teaching that you are Brahman. You were Brahman, you are Brahman, and you will always be Brahman. Once that is there, you are a Jeevan Mukta. Very beautiful verse. Okay, now let us look at verse number 10. So please unmute yourself. Vayasigate kakkama vikaraha. Vayasigate kakkama vikaraha. Shushke nire kahaka saraha. Shushke nire kahaka saraha. Shine vitte kafparivaraha. Yate tatve kahasam saraha. Yate Okay. So, look at the word meanings first. Kaya sigate. So, vaya sigate. So, vaya is the age. Gate means having gone. Having passed. Vayasigate, when the age has gone, kaha kama vikara. So vikara is change, a product basically over here. Kaha is what here? Kama vikara. Kama is here. Kama means desires, but here it should be taken as sexual desires or lust for that matter. And he is saying, Vayasigate, kaha kama vikara. When the body has gone old, Age, vayasigati, when age has gone by, which means years have gone by, when the body has gone old, when it is no longer capable of satisfying your desires, kaha kama vikaraha, what good is the sexual desire of yours? So that is the first statement. Second is sushke nire, so nira is the waters, shushka means to dry up. Sushke nire, where the waters have dried up, kaha kasaraha, what use is the lake? A lake is an area with a body of water. So when the water is gone, he says, what uses the lake? And then he comes down and says, Kshine vitte, when the wealth has gone, Kaha parivaraha, where is your family? Gyate tatve, when the truth has been understood. What truth? I am Brahman. Gyate tatve, when you have understood the truth of I am Brahman, Kaha samsaraha, where is samsara? Very, very beautiful. So what we are <coughs> looking at is this verse is exploring the karya karana sambandha, cause and effect relationship. Cause and product relationship is being explored. <coughs> Sorry. And therefore he says, Vayasigate, when youth has gone by, kama vikaraha. So what he means is that this expression of passion in the human body is basically. Uh, expression of youth. When you are young and strong and your hormones are running wild, ka kama vikaraha is the expression of passion in the human body. So he says, <coughs> Vayasigate kama vikaraha. How can there be an expression of lust in your body when the youth, which is the very karanam, the youthfulness is the cause and the passion is the effect. That is what he is saying. That because you are young, because your body is young, <coughs> which is the cause, which is the karanam, there is a product <coughs> which is the passion or the lust in the body. And therefore, he says, how can that product continue to exist when the cause is gone? So, where the cause is gone, 
why should the effect continue and if it continues <clears throat> then what is to be the conclusion So first there is a statement that when the karanam is gone, the karyam will no longer be there. And then you have, to, you have to supply a statement, but the karanam is gone and the karyam continues to be there. When the youth is gone and that sexual desire continues to be there, what should be my conclusion? Can you think? That it was not the cause of that effect. No. There's that, a superimposition that. of my age. Beg your pardon, Vashnavi? There is a superimposition of the age of the body when the body is old. Yes. So you cannot question the karya kara relationship. There's the, a the statement which is made saying that youth is the cause of passion. And if youth has gone and passion continues to exist, then there is an error somewhere, right? What is that error? What would be that error? Your not age understanding. Oh, no, youth is not the cause. No, the error is that no, your no. idea of your age is different from what the age is. So there's an error. Not age appropriate. <clears throat> so mentally, I think I'm 25 years old. Physically, the body is 95 years old. But the mental image continues to be 25 years old. And because the mental image is the karanam, basically. Mental image of yourself is not true to the reality. And therefore, you continue that lust continues. This is moha, delusion. Okay. So he says that wherever this karya karana sambandha has been violated, know that there is a delusion somewhere. That is what is being said. And so he gives more examples. Shushke nire, when the water has dried up, where is the pond or the lake? The lake no longer exists. Similarly, shine vitte, vittam is wealth. So shine vitte, after the wealth is exhausted, kaha parivaraha, where is the family? Where, is the, where are the people around you who are always there when they have something to gain from you? Here again, there is a Karya, Karana, Karya, Sambandha. There is a cause-effect relationship. The cause here is wealth. And the people around you are the product. Okay. So we have to learn from here that I want people and situations to be available, to be functioning according to my requirements. Right? Isn't that true of most of us? We want everybody to do what we would like them to do. Right? And when that fails to happen, my response is anger or depression. So the, the learning here is that I have to learn to be objective. This passion is what is being talked about. I have learned to accept the world as it is. I have to become less and less demanding. Because when I see the world for what it really is, then I will not have any false expectations. And therefore, my demands will not be there. If my demands are not there, my expectations are not there, the anger also will not be there. The effect, the product, the karyam can go only when the karanam remains. Right? As long as the karanam remains, the effect will keep on coming. And therefore, finally, he comes to the last one. Jyate tatve kaha samsaraha. When knowledge of the absolute truth is obtained, the absolute truth is what? I am Brahman. When that knowledge is there, where is samsaraha? So what is being said here? Remember that samsaraha we described long ago. Samyak sarati asmin iti samsaraha. The word samsaraha is made of two things. There is some, there is, there is sara and some. Okay, so sara is coming from, coming from the dhatu shru, which means to move. And that is why sarati, from the word shru, shru, shru samyak sarati. Sarati means to move. Samyak means constantly moving. 
So samyak sarati, that which is constantly in movement, as means sansaraha, that is sansaraha, that which is in constant movement. And what kind of motion are we talking about? So we call it bhava, bhava roga they call samsara. Always trying to become something, you know. In the samsara what happens is that I am always trying to become something other than what I really am. I am trying to move from one situation to another situation. I am trying to move from one birth to another birth. I am trying to move from some accomplishment to another accomplishment. I am constantly moving. And that's why samsara is called bhava roga, the problem of bhava. Bhava means to be. The problem of becoming, that is called samsara. So samsara is what finally, why are you trying to become something or the other? Because you are not satisfied with what you really are. And therefore, from if I was a, if I was working as a clerk, I want to be an officer. If I'm working as an officer, I want to be a manager, and so on, so on. If I'm a manager, I want to be executive. If I'm executive, I want to be MD, and so on. You are never really satisfied with what you are. So samsara is this self non-acceptance. I am not satisfied with the way I am now, right? Very unfortunately, this non-acceptance also I cannot accept. Why? Because we have self-awareness and because we have self-awareness, we have self-judgment also. Right? And this self-judgment is the fundamental problem. Right? How do you know it is peculiar only to human beings? Self-judgment. Supposing you have two dogs. One dog with a long tail one with a short tail. Okay. Now, is the dog with a short tail jealous of the dog with a long tail? No. There is no self-judgment over there. That is peculiar to self-aware people, humans. And therefore, he says, Jnate Tatve. When the truth that you are Brahman is known, Kaha Samsara. Where is the Samsara at all? When Jnate Tatve, when I know myself as Brahman, I know that I am all that is really there. And there is no more non-acceptance because I know the truth about myself. When does this non-acceptance come in? When I don't know who I really am. When I have a false conception about my own self. If I really knew what I was, that I am Brahman, I would love myself, but I do not. And because I do not love myself, this is a crucial portion. Since I don't have self-love, since I do not love myself, I seek it outside. I expect that, that deficiency, which is basically what that I am not loving myself. But I expect that deficiency of love to be met by the outside world. And therefore, I want the world to love me, the world to respect me. The world should be very fond of me, not because I deserve all that. But the reason is very simple. The reason is that I am not able to love myself. I am not able to respect myself. And therefore, to fulfill that deficiency, I want others to respect me. That is what is being mentioned over here. Okay. We look at verse number 11. It is the same tone. It continues. So let us unmute yourself and we can chant. Ma kuru dhana jana yauvana garvam. Ma kuru dhana jana yauvana garvam. Harashini harash harati nime shakala hasarvam. Harati nime shakala hasarvam. Maya maya midamakhilam hitva. Maya Brahma Padam Pam Pravisha Vedva Brahma Padam Pram Pravisha Vedva. Okay. So you say Ma Kuru Dhanajana Jauvana Garva. Ma Kuru Ma is Sanskrit for don't or no. Kuru means don't do. So, ma kuru, don't do effectively, which means ma kuru garvam. You have to 
you have to take those words properly. Ma kuru has to be connected to garvam, the last word of that phrase. So ma kuru garvam, do not take pride in what? Dhana, wealth or possessions, jana, people around you. And importantly, yauvana, your youthfulness, do not take pride. So in jana, you can take it as, do not take pride in the fact that because of your talent or your intellect or your position in life, you command the, you may be commanding the respect of people or you may be having a control over a lot of people. So do not take pride in that fact. Why? You look at the reason why people are, are under you or why you control people or why people respect you. If it is your talent which is given to you, the talent is not yours. It is not your achievement. It is given by the Lord. If it is your intellect, if you are a very bright person, very intelligent person, and that is why you respect it, understand that intellect is not your achievement. It is given by the Lord. If you have a beautiful body, remember that that body is not your achievement. It is given by the Lord. And therefore, he says, try to understand that I have truly created nothing. There are no achievements of mine. What is there to be proud of? Okay, that is one. Then dhana. So dhana here includes power, position, name, fame. I cannot even claim all these as mine. right? If I am very wealthy, the chances are that I have inherited. It's certainly just a stroke of luck. If I have earned it, supposing I have been born poor and I have earned a lot of money, then you have to say, what is it because of which I earned money? Intellect or talents. So neither the intellect nor the talent has been created by me. I claim to be an engineer or doctor and I earn lots of money on the strength of the knowledge. That is not my creation. So don't be proud of it. Mahakuru Garvam. Don't be proud of that. Then Yavanam. Do not take pride in your youth, he says. Because what? This youth of yours is lent to you by Kalaha, by the time principle. And nothing will prevent Kalaha from taking it back. You have no control over the passing of your youth. So, Vayasigate, you have no control over the passing of time. How then can I take any pride in the youthfulness of my body or mind? You can't. And you will remember here, Tayadattana Pradabhyaho Bhungate Sthena Eva Saha. Bhagavad Gita, third chapter. The one who ob enjoys objects given by the gods without offering to them in return, without offering to them in return, without offering thanks to them in return, oblations to them in return, he says, Bhungte Sthena, Sthena Eva Saha. He is indeed a, indeed a thief. So, Tayadattana Bhungte, the one who enjoys without offering the gods obeisances or salutations, he is indeed a thief. That has to be connected here. Therefore, whatever is given to you by the Lord, remember the Lord is constantly doing me favors. And that is why I am able to enjoy the universe. I am indebted to my the sages, the rishis, to my ancestors and then to gods. So Rishiran is called Rishirana. Our debt to the rishis, sages and thinkers. Because whatever knowledge we get, whatever scriptural knowledge we have, the vast storehouses of scriptural knowledge which we are able to study today, that is because of what? There are all these rishis who have dedicated their whole lives to the study and analysis of that knowledge. There are people who have written commentaries and commentaries and people who have written sub-commentaries on the commentaries and there are people who have written sub-commentaries on the sub-commentaries. The volume of spiritual literature which we have is phenomenal. To all these rishis, we owe our thanks because, because of them that we are able to access that knowledge. So Rishiran. Then Pitran is the debt to my parents and ancestors. Why? For having given me the gift of this body and for having raised it and nourished it and brought me to a level where I can use my intellect to understand, I can use my body and mind and my talents to earn. And therefore, I am forever indebted to my parents and ancestors. And there is Devarin. So, Devata here means cosmic forces, which are constantly functioning. 
in order to support all of us. The sun, the moon, the earth, the fires, the waters, law of gravity, everything is there. They are constantly working in order to support me. And if you want to understand how things would be if these, if these forces were not working perfectly, just imagine if the earth moved a few thousand miles closer to the sun, what would happen? It will burn. You would be toast, you know. <laughs> that, that's it. Burnt. And if it moved a few thousand miles away, you would be a piece of ice. So imagine this, the preciseness with which everything works. And therefore, without their favors, we cannot survive, we cannot exist. Therefore, we have to realize that all the factors, all these factors are constantly contributing to make me enjoy my life so that I can enjoy my life. And therefore, the proper understanding of this, if you have understood properly, it can lead only to humility, never to pride. Right? And therefore, we must remember that it is not permanent at all. And that's why Shankara says, Harati Nimeshat. Harati means takes away. And Kalaha Sarvam. So Kalaha Sarvam Harati. Time, that is Kalaha here is Yamadharma Raja. Also called Kalaha. Death, the Lord of Death. Kalaha Sarvam Harati. Takes away everything. And he doesn't need to give a notice. So Nimeshat. In a mere instant. So, Kalaha Sarvam Harati Nimesha. In one instant, a time or death can take away everything. You know, we have seen examples of how, how great people, very intelligent people, get into an accident and suddenly they, they become vegetables for the rest of their lives. And you may have all had experiences of young and active friends. Suddenly he is discovered to be seriously ill, he's dead in a few weeks. Right? So, Shankara is reminding you that Lord Yama can come at any time. It is not necessary that we will all live to be a hundred. Lord Yama does not need to send you a notice. He can just come and pick you up and take you away. And therefore, enjoy what you have. It is not that Shastra is saying become a fatalist or a pessimist. He says enjoy whatever you have in the present without any pride. Have humility. Recognize the contribution of so many people and elements and powers in what you think is your achievement. And therefore, meditate on Govinda. Bhaja Govindam, Bhaja Govindam. And realize what? Maya Mayam Idam Akhilam. So, Idam Akhilam means this entire universe. Idam in Sanskrit, which means this. The scriptures, this means Jagat, the universe. So, idam akhilam. This entire universe, Maya, Mayam. Is a, mayam is a product of what? Of Maya. What is Maya over here? Dhanjan Yogan. No, no, no. Illusion. Samsara. Mithya, Mithya. See the sentence again. Idam Akilam, the entire universe, Maya Mayam. Mayam is a product of, so Maya Mayam is product of Maya. Srishti. You have to get the right words to understand. Maya is basically what? Matter. Mithya. Jagat. Maya is matter. Prakriti. Prakriti consists of what? Yada. Prakriti consists of? Tattva Bodha. Tattva Bodha. Trigunas. Okay. Another name for Trigunas? Tattva Rajasthamas. Pancha Mahabhuta. Whenever you hear the word product, mm. you must immediately connect with Tattva Bodha. The entire universe is a product of what? Of five elements only. So, Idam Akhilam Maya Mayam. The entire universe is a product of the five elements only. First, the Sukshma five elements, the subtle five elements, which combine to form the five elementals. What were they called? Bhauti. The Bhauta, Bhuta, Bhautikani. Bhautikani. So, Bhuta and Bhautikani. 
So may you realize that all this creation is Maya Mayam. Is a product of these five elements only. And also, because Maya is visible to you, Maya's beauty, you tend to fo focus on the form and not look at the substance. Mm. Remember that none of the things that offer us security or happiness, which appear to offer us security or happiness, can ever do so. And therefore, he says, Dhana Jana Yauvana. You think all these are real. But remember, they are all Maya, Maya only. They are all products of Maya only. They can never provide you with the necessary security. So, Akhilam Hitva. This entire universe abandon this Maya. Hitva means to, to, to drop, to renounce. Abandon this Maya. Renunciation is not an action. Remember, renunciation comes out of the attitude towards the world. The maturity of mind which I have, that is renunciation. I don't physically renounce anything. I do not discard anything outwardly. So when I give up something and yet feel its loss, that is not what is being talked about. That is not renunciation. If you have given up something and constantly feel the loss of that thing, it is only external renunciation. You have not really renounced it mentally. And the example I often use is, you know, Gilly Danda. Or if you want to more sophisticated, Barbie dolls. Many of you ladies were, had Barbie dolls in your, in your childhood, right? Where are they now? Do you even feel the loss of them? So that is, you have just given it up because it was no longer appealing to you. You have outgrown it. In, in, in the terms of Shastra, it says that you, are, you have learned to see that Barbie doll without adhyasa, without superimposition, without the extra value attached to it. You are seeing the Barbie doll and therefore for you now, it is no longer having any value. Similarly, like the Gilly Danda, the men have played with, they have seen it without adhyasa. For you, it has no value. So remember, as far as problems are concerned in our lives, we have two types of problems. There is a problem which is externally centered which means the problem is not inside me. It is centered upon the world. The world is the locus of the problem. And therefore, the problems relate to the objects around you. For, for instance, the problem of poverty or the problem of hunger, that problem is centered into the world. It is centered on the world. And to solve a problem which is centered on the world, you need the world to solve that problem. So to solve the problem of hunger, which is centered on the body, what do you need? You need food, which is also centered on the world. So body is anatma, the food is also anatma. If there is a problem of poverty, that poverty is also anatma. The money required to sort out that poverty is also anatma. And therefore, for a problem centered on the external world, you require an externally oriented solution. But when the problem is centered upon yourself, right? it relates to me. What kind of problems? Problem of sadness, problem of sorrow, problem of uh, fear, problem of uh, inadequacy, problem of apurnatvam, limitation, these are all centered in me only. And just as I look to the world to solve problems which are centered on the world, when there are problems centered in me, there is no point in looking to the world. I alone can be the solution. Therefore, we have to understand the nature of the problem and apply an appropriate solution. For external problems, Bhajagovindam or Bhagavad Gita will not remove hunger. Right? It's an external problem. The appropriate solution for hunger is to eat food. And you need the world for that. So problem centered upon the anatma require the anatma to solve it. Problem centered upon the world require the world to solve it. But when there are problems centered on me, 
on myself, on ourselves, such as insecurity, apurnatvam, or fear, we should not try to look at the world. Don't look externally to solve problems which are centered internally. Because those problems cannot be recognized, cannot be solved by any objects or people found in the world. And the recognition of this fact, so Akhilam Hitva, the word Hitva, all this long talk of mine about recognizing where the problem lies. So when I understand that external objects can solve external problems and problems internal to me can be solved only internal to me, that understanding of this fact is what is called enunciation. And if that has happened, Brahma Padam from Pravisha Vidva, Viditva. Brahma Padam, your true, true nature, Viditva. So Brahma Padam Viditva, having understood your true nature, Tvam Pravishaha, may you enter that state of Brahman. May you enter that state of Moksha. So here again, we have to understand that there is no real entry. There is no physical travel involved in Pravisha. The renunciation happens when I understand that the fundamental problem of not accepting myself can be solved only by knowledge of what I really am. Because if I know I am Brahman, then I will cease not to accept myself. And when I know that knowledge of Brahman is necessary for solving these internally oriented problems, then I will not look outward anymore for solving these problems. And therefore, Vam Pravesha means having understood that I am Brahman. When I say having understood my true nature, Brahma Padam is basically true nature of Brahman, which is the same as true nature of myself, which is to say that I am Brahma Asmi, that I am Brahman alone. That understanding is called Pravishaha. Entering the state of moksha, entering the state of Brahman. And this I can understand and solve only when I have understood that the problem lies in me alone. No point looking outward for any solution. Okay. We will do one more verse and then I'll throw it open for. Let's look at verse number 12. We will chant. <coughs> Dinya minya sayam prataha. Dinya minya sayam prataha. Shishira vasanta punarayataha. Shishira vasanta punirayataha. Kala creed at the gachatiya yuhu. Kāla Okay. So, dina. Dina is, dina, then yamin, you have to be broken up properly. Dina and yamini. What does it mean? Day and night. Day and night. is night. Dina is day. Dinya minyo. Yeah, day and night. Sayam prataha. Evening and morning. Sishira vasantaha. Winter and spring. Punarayataha. They come again and again and again. So he's talking about the cycle. The natural cycle of day and night. Morning and evening. Winter and spring. They always come. Punarayata. They come again and again. The cycle never ceases. And because... So what is it happening? When it's coming again and again, it means time is passing. Right? Because these things happen only in time. Time is passing. Kala kridati gachati ayuhu. Kala kridati gachati ayuhu. If you want to break it up properly. Kala kridati. Time is constantly dancing. It is constantly playing. And Ayu Gachati, your Ayu, your age is passing. So this signifies the passage of time, all these things. 
cycle of day and night, morning and evening, spring and winter, all is signifying that time is passing. And Gachati Ayuhu, your life is passing by, your age is going older and older, you're getting older and older. And therefore, you are aging. Just as this time will not stop for day and night, morning and evening, etc., etc., time will not stop for your body also. So once you are born, the process of aging starts. Nothing can stop that. And therefore, it's Tadapi. Tadapi means even then. Even when, even as Ayuhu Gachati, even as the body grows old, Na Munchati, Munchati means uh, go away. So Na Munchati, what Na Munchati? Asha Vayuhu. The winds of desire. Vayu, vayu is winds. Asha is desire. Asha Vayuhu Na Munchati. These winds of desire, they do not leave the jiva. They do not leave you. Your body gets exhausted. It grows old. And it's no longer capable of most of the things it was capable in its, early, in its younger days. So what Shankara is saying is, as the body grows old, it is expected that the mind should also mature. Time does not spare anybody. It takes life with it sooner or later. That is why the name Kalaha is given for Lord Yama. And Shankara is saying, live your life, life intelligently. Eat the food, but don't let the food eat you. Enjoy the objects of the world, but don't be a slave to them. Don't let the objects enjoy you. Retain your freedom. Develop some sort of inner space, inner leisure. Learn to depend on your own self for happiness. Become free from dependence upon the world for enjoyment. You should be able to enjoy the world because you are happy. World should not be the cause for your enjoyment. And if you are happy by yourself, then every interaction of yours with the world will be enjoyment only. This is true vairagya, true dispassion. So with this, I'll stop for today. Any questions? So only gratitude. <laughs> no question. <laughs> okay. So thank you so much. And we will see you next week. Thank you. 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 Thank you.